All right, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for attending this session. Uh, we're going to have a very good panel discussion here uh, with some uh, experts from, uh, from uh, industry leading companies that, that are going to share insights about uh, organizational best practices for cloud adoption. Um, so I'd like to welcome on stage, first of all, uh, Mark Williams, who uh, uh, before joining Redapt was the uh, CTO of infrastructure at uh, Zynga and led their, uh, uh, basically their public cloud and their private cloud build out. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Mariano Coniti, who is uh, the CTO at Enter, an Italian service provider that's built a three data center uh, OpenStack public cloud. I'd like to introduce Ariel, uh, who f before, joining <laughs> before joining Scale VP as an investor, so he's our money guy, uh, was uh, a director of engineering at Netflix and built the very fa famous Netflix OSS tooling for that Netflix used to adopt cloud. And then I'd like to introduce Ian, who is the uh, CEO and founder of CloudOps. And, um, and let's give them a round of applause to welcome them. All right, so um, just to kick it off, uh, I would like to ask the audience a couple questions just to get a feel for, for what the breakdown is. If you're from IT, can you raise your hand right now? And if you consider yourself more of an application developer or, or not IT, would you raise your hand? All right, so a little bit less, but mostly IT. Awesome. Um, so, um, so let's kick it off with a couple kind of anecdotes, a couple things to break the ice. Um, so how about we, uh, um, uh, do you guys have any st interesting stories of things that you've seen uh, in cloud adoption that were really not cloud, some, some fun stories to tell there? Mark or, or Ian? Cloud adoption that, <coughs> excuse me, cloud adoption that hasn't been cloud. A lot of the customers that I'm helping out there, um, excuse me, I don't know what's wrong with my voice. <coughs> That's better. Uh, a lot of the customers I've kind of helped engage and express their, their vision for, for their future of cloud have, have wanted to stick to so many proprietary technologies that might be on that list of what is considered supported by the orchestration software that they're taking a look at. But inevitably what happens is it becomes so unique and custom and unupgradable over the long, long term that it ends up not being a cloud. So, you know, what I try to educate such customers on is, is really the value of having kind of a utilitarian version of cloud that is very simple. Uh, you know, just coming from an operations experience, getting that phone call in the middle of the night when something is broken, you know, the value of keeping things very simple. Uh, eliminating uh, potential points of failure is, is super valuable. So having all that custom complexity stuff is, is where I think you have a lot of risks in, in, in that form of it. Ian, any uh, fun stories of uh, stuff? You yeah, I guess, um, you know, I, I think what we've seen is, uh, you know, since the topic's barriers of cloud adoption, we're seeing a lot of cloud adoption, but we're seeing a lot of uh, very, um, uh, we're seeing a lot of cloud adoption sort of echo what you know Mark's point was that is uh, is fundamentally not changing the way people work or changing the processes people are, are using. So they're adopting the technology, but you, you don't have the uh, the cultural change. Uh, you know, DevOps is a great example, sort of a, a sort of an aspirational way of working with cloud. But also on the process side, we see a, a ton of, uh, of of problems uh, when we go in with, with a lot of customers. They'll have uh, They'll have very, very strange deployments on Amazon or even internally uh, that are fundamentally explained by how they procure services yeah. and how they manage them. So they'll do things like adopt cloud, but you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to sort of dynamically spin up and destroy instances. They have some like really slow ITIL change management <laughs> process with lots of approvals that are required. So th obviously that's a really big problem. And then on the flip side, sort of in the enterprise data center, we see things like people trying to deploy uh, you know, OpenStack or Hadoop clusters on, on Blade servers and IBM SANS, which is just, you know, I mean, aside from, in many cases, defeating the purpose, uh, also you know, leads to all kinds of you know, really awkward operational issues. So um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of cloud adoption. I don't think there's a lot of barriers to cloud adoption, which is actually leading to the problem of people adopting cloud very poorly. So, so on the topic of cultural change, me, oh, go ahead. Let me, let me add just one quick thing, which is, which is funny because I just heard this um, over lunch uh, today when I was sitting down. 
And this was, uh, you know, one company that we're all familiar with that I wouldn't, you know, I won't repeat the name of. But they, um, you know, this, um, this person was telling me about how they went through this, you know, cloud adoption, cloud migration phase. And, you know, it took a couple of years. And they're very unhappy with it. They're very unhappy with the results. And, you know, now they're thinking about alternatives. And kind of when I asked about the details, it turned out that basically what they did was they took, you know, their existing legacy applications, their existing architecture, and kind of forklifted that and just moved it into the cloud, you know, never scaled up, never scaled down, you know, always used those resources. And then were very unhappy because the cloud cost so much more mm -hmm. uh, than, than their, uh, you know, what they were paying for in-house. And, you know, I think that echoes a lot of the, cost concerns uh, that, that you hear from people migrating to the mm -hmm. cloud. And this, you know, in this particular case, it was a public cloud use case. Um, but you, know, you hear this for, for private cloud as well, where unless you're also um, marrying that migration with you know, rethinking about how to re-architect your applications and your, and your processes in, to be more cloud native, then you're not really in the cloud. Yeah, there's a lot of cloud, um, cloud challenges and disillusion when you move to the cloud because of those uh, those processes that might have not changed. So on, on the topic of cultural change, uh, what, what are the, in your opinion, what are the, the, the first things to tackle when you're, when you're trying to take a big organization that's, uh, that's, that's using the, the traditional model and moving that to a, a DevOps type model? Mariano. In my expertise, um, as far as I can see uh, in the Italian market, but I think it's uh, the same everywhere, uh, the cloud is, uh, uh, source of stress for organization. <laughs> I think you laughed, so you, I think you agree. <laughs> uh, every organization is stressed by the, by the concept of cloud. Um, you asked for a story before. I have the story of the uh, what, a guy that I called uh, nervous guy. He, <laughs> he came. He came up. He showed up and asked him for. Uh, okay, we we run this large uh, hospital and healthcare application, and we want to run it on the cloud. We are building a startup. We want to move it to the cloud. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's see how the application is done, and let's see how how our architecture fits your needs. And then we started to dig into the application, and we discovered uh, w during me a meeting with the, the project manager, mm -hmm. the, the lead developer, and the CEO of the company, we discovered that a lot of stuff w was done by, it was a Java and Oracle typical application, was done inside Oracle, and nobody knew what happened inside this Oracle with 700 tables inside. A lot of the application mm -hmm. was delegated to the, the, the database. So we saw the CEO becoming very, very upset, and <laughs> the project manager becoming <laughs> very, very um, uncomfortable. And so in the next meeting, he became always more and more nervous because he understood he had to take up the information and the process that was delegated to an external uh, Depot like uh, Oracle and the people working with Oracle and the consultant, he, mm -hmm. he, he needed to take it back to the company. Uh, he understood he, have, he had lost the value of the company, which was the process, and he had to get it back into the company. And in order to go to the cloud and to make an application scale, uh, uh, design a good architecture for databases, for front ends, for middleware, he had to understand how it worked, really. And so he understood the huge amount of work he had to do, and to and he had to learn a and, new way and to that, work. That work was was uh, a organizational change, yeah. and increased collaboration, that sort of. Yeah, when you when you bring up the process, you are half the way you have to go. the The second half is to re-implement it in a smart way. If you are running a startup, you are five people, one couple of developers, and you want to just translate the a legacy application to a new cloud-aware application. There's a lot of work to do once. You cannot, you cannot afford to do it twice or three mm -hmm. times or any time. So the guys is still nervous now. So, um, yeah, go ahead, Mark. I can kind of speak personally for what my transformation was kind of going through this at, at Zynga. So early, early on, before we had really done anything with cloud, um, you know, I had a very stressful job to ensure that all of the infrastructure was up. I felt like that was my domain. It wasn't necessarily a control issue, but it was mm -hmm. a confidence issue that I know how to make this work for my customer who I'm allocating infrastructure for. What became clear to me is as the needs of my customer 
outpaced my ability to really support them in a, in a manner that was going to drive their business requirements. I found that I needed to be more transparent and in fact more collaborative and providing an education to my customer about what it is that are my pain points, right? So one group, specific example of this was <clears throat> our two biggest games were literally consuming all of the private data center space and server capacity I had. I was in the middle of doing our second data center. This is before we had done really anything in public cloud yet. Mm -hmm. and. Our, one of the CTOs of, of a game studio and his SVP wanted to come into my data center. And, and I'm like, I don't have time for that was my initial reaction, right? Like, I know what I'm doing. I can just talk you out of this, right? I need to keep focusing on getting your hardware to you mm -hmm. and moving you into this next data center. Uh, I, I had a rational epiphany to go ahead and do this. And what I realized is that their reaction to walking through this data center and seeing empty spaces in all the racks was a natural conclusion of, well, why can't you just put more servers in there? Like, mm -hmm. that they don't really have an appreciation for what these challenges are in, in real infrastructure. And so it was great to educate them so that they really help me think through, well, how can we do this differently? How can we make, how can we make this easier for, for me? Um, and so through that transparency and, and really collaborating, you know, we were able to kind of take those next steps and accelerate how we, how we did this in successive investments and, and, and later investments in how we did cloud. Um, Ariel, were there any changes in relationships between application developers and, and IT at Netflix? Yeah, yeah, quite a bit. Um, so <laughs> I'm I think, there is. I think, there's, I think there, there were really kind of two key things that we did at Netflix as part of the cloud migration that um, you know, in hindsight, made it successful, um, and I think are really two uh, you know key ingredients for for anyone doing it. And so, you know, kind of painting the picture of what it was like before we um, moved into the cloud, we were you know very traditional kind of IT organization. Um, we had an IT operations team that was responsible for managing and maintaining the site, and then we had a, a product team that was building all of the software. And you know, every six weeks, it would get on a train and a release train. Um, or not six weeks, two weeks, uh, it would get on a release train and um, uh, you know, get deployed by IT ops into, into the production environment. And then you know, whenever, whenever someone checked in some bad code or there was a problem with the deployment, you know, the whole train stopped, everybody got on board, figured out what was wrong, and then you know, it, it got through again. So you know, part of the, the cloud migration was really rethinking the application architecture and moving from this monolithic large Java application into uh, you know, large-scale distributed service-oriented architecture that was all centered around um, this notion of microservices and very, very small units um, of, of uh, logic that would be able to scale up and scale down on, on their own and have you know, very uh, relatively limited blast radius for failures. So that was you know, one key of moving to the cloud. It wasn't simply, well, let's replace the infrastructure. It was, let's rework the whole application and really take advantage of this new compute um, platform that we have, which is the cloud. That, by the way, is based on an unreliable set of um, resources. And even though you might think that you have a reliable set of resources in the data center, they're you know, equally unreliable. So that was another really important design um, assumption that we had. The second part um, of that migration was really tearing apart that wall between IT operations and, um, and the product team. And, and in fact, we actually did away with the entire IT operations. Um, I shouldn't say did away with, but we refocused their, um, their work on supporting all of the corporate systems and all of the customer facing systems were now moved into the product. Uh, the engineering group. And so every single engineer that was building um, code, that was building software to be eventually deployed into the production environment was now responsible for deploying that code into the production environment and was now also responsible for getting that call at 3 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday night if their piece of code was somehow uh, causing a problem. And so that, you know, you'd be amazed at how quickly that aligns the incentives for making sure that your code is well tested and that you have kind of all the operational assumptions that you need in order to uh, run your service effectively at the development phase and not you know, found later by uh, an IT operations team that feels like they've been you know, handed this hot potato that they have to maintain. So I think those are really the two of the um, you know, really key factors for making that cloud migration successful. One was re-architecting the application to be in a cl uh, cloud native, and the second one was eliminating that gap between IT operations and development and really collapsing that all into a single function. On, on the topic of that gap, uh, what, what's the biggest reluctant, like, uh, where did you see the most reluctance and the most difficulty in getting people to change as opposed to getting systems to change? Ian, if you want to tackle that, or Mark? 
Oh, I, I was just <laughs> actually just going to add, um, you know, there's certainly with a number of our customers a huge amount of reluctance that I, I suspect at, at Zynga Netflix was a little bit easier to resolve because Netflix and Zynga are, you know, both online business models mm -hmm. where the, the, uh, the, the profit center, mm -hmm. uh, basically the line of business is highly aligned with the technologists in the organization. Um, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the large enterprises, um, uh, even if they've got a significant investment in software development, we've, we're working with one that has 260 uh, applications that they're developing. Um, they, in fact, do have aspects of the line of the business that are completely online businesses, but there's a, there's a massive battle being waged, and, and it basically comes down to uh, you know, a, a CTO who's got a group of developers who are charged with sort of driving the innovation and uh, ultimately contributing to the success of the, uh, uh, success of the, of the business um, and are much more profit-centric uh, um, sort of aligned. And then you've got a CIO and a, and a very large IT group who ultimately, right, like right from the top, are are organized around managing a uh, you know a, a, you know large budgets, which are committed to significantly in advance, and the and the CIO is compensated not based upon necessarily supporting sort of increased rates of change and innovation, but in fact based upon you know cutting five percent off the budget. So there's I, I think uh, so a lot of the larger organizations we're working with. The, the, the biggest barrier really starts at the top with how those executives are compensated and how they collaborate. And in this particular case, um, what's interesting is uh, there's, we're helping them with an OpenStack project right now, but it's uh, unfortunately what's happened is sort of the, and we've worked for both sides of the fence, which is also rather interesting. Like we've done work for the IT guys. Uh, we sort of, uh, you know, did a cloud strategy, did a cloud architecture for them. But then they ran into sort of these procurement politics and like, all right, well, how do we take the cloud ops architecture and then make that real with our existing suppliers and our existing budget? And it just basically ground to a halt. Um, and, uh, and then we continue to work with the, uh, with the sort of more innovation side of the fence. And uh, to date, they've really just been adopting Amazon, but they basically got to a point where it's just, it, it's just uh, too costly and, 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 and they want to, uh, they, they want to uh, do, do a significant chunk of their development uh, on in-house infrastructure. And so we've been, we've been uh, contracted to go in there and help them with an OpenStack cloud. But this is all happening, I would characterize it as a bit of a sort of a skunk works project. So it's, it doesn't really have the support of the executive level. Mm -hmm. They're aware of it, but they're sort of like, well, let's see what, you know, the CTO and the developers are able to do over here with some, uh, you know, on a, on a shoestring budget. So it doesn't really have a, I'd argue, the characteristics of constructive cloud adoption. Yeah. Mark, you, you have a lot of experience yeah. as an integrator for lar very large organizations. Well, can, can I answer your first question? Because you fir at first you stumped me because like, wow, at Zynga we really didn't have a reluctance to do things in a more modern way. But what I have actually seen being <laughs> in the system integrator role. Spill it out. <laughs> that I've seen it not only at the executive alignment level, but uh, in fact, the first week on the job at Redapt, I was participating in a, in a cloud workshop where we're discovering well, what is it that your workloads need mm -hmm. to do to, to be cloud enabled and how do we help you do that? And it, the, the customer had initiated this plan from one individual in a leadership position, but not really socialized it with his team that he was taking a new course to do this cloud natively. And his team was white knuckled on exactly the way they've been doing it. We're going to stick with our blade servers. We're going to stick with our, you know, very proprietary networking topologies. We're going to stick with VLANs. We're going to, you know, and and it was very awkward to be in this <laughs> meeting educating them and trying to suss out detail about how to build a cloud for this team that did not want to build a cloud. Mm -hmm. And I've I've since seen uh, in some of our customer space there's some acquisition going on where we've built native clouds for them and then an acquiring company will come in and these white knuckled guys are coming in and they're kicking the cloud out like because they are so fixated on the traditional historical ways they've been doing it. So, so in the face of that reluctance what did you guys do? Well in, in a sense of an acquisition if the acquiring company is is leading that we're not really being asked to impact that unfortunately. Okay. So what we are hoping and unfortunately the acquiring company has been losing the employees that have, have 
paved this new way, trying all the while to educate above, like this is the value of it. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we, are, we are a smaller team kind of ratio to infrastructure wise than what the acquiring company is doing for the same effective you know, capacity management and it's not resonating. So we're not in a great position because our relationship has been with the acquiree rather than the acquirer. Yeah. I want to um, just make a comment about the, the previous comment that Ian made, which I think is a very good one, that centralized IT has been, uh, its policies, I think, have been one of the things that have driven a lot of public cloud adoption to date, um, which is that you're starting to see this, you know, what's being termed shadow IT, where, um, you know, all of the business users and the technical application developers are, you know, taking it on themselves to create the mechanisms that they need in order to innovate quickly. And they're being successful at it and they're being rewarded you know, at the business level and they're getting support from you know, their executive um, uh, teams for it and they're able to you know, outcompete their uh, industry competitors. And so what you're seeing now is you know, all of these different shadow IT springing up in different organizations and I think the CIOs are starting to realize that um, what they need to do is to start enabling that and to start being more of a service provider to the rest of the organization rather than the control and the gatekeepers. And so, you know, at least from, from what I've seen from the more innovative you know, IT organizations, they're shifting towards um, thinking about how they can enable uh, their uh, application users and their functional business units to take advantage of some of these new technologies in order to be more agile, in order to be more innovative, rather than you know, trying to always play the cost argument or the security argument or the control argument. And that, you know, I think that's a very positive thing for you know, the overall industry. So it, it, so, sorry, uh, it seems like uh, the dot coms uh, and the online businesses tend to have it a little bit easier with cloud than, than more regulated industries. Uh, what would be your recommendations if, say, a large healthcare provider wanted to make a big step or a bank wanted to make a big step into the cloud? What would be the, the well, what sort of change would need to, to happen there? So I think most of the the, the web 2.0s, the gaming companies have had the luxury of no legacy, right? Yep. So that's why there was really no resistance to adopting a new method. But having worked with a lot of more enterprises and, and more risk averse companies, um, trying to boil the ocean with one massive overhaul is, is not an approach that is ever going to work. Mm -hmm. Getting uh, whomever is in the company that is starting this skunk works or hopefully a top down directive to mm -hmm. go this direction, always encourage them to start small, find your earliest, um, your, your best candidate as your internal customer that can be your early adopter mm -hmm. and can co-evangelize and co-develop what those requirements for that cloud are. Once you've successfully, and then here's another thing I actually really did experience. Once I built a private cloud and having a company that was 85% dependent on a public cloud at the time, nobody wanted to move in. Everybody was you know, warm and fuzzy in, in their little, so how do you get your first customer in there, right? So this, is, this ties into the same thing I educate customers on is you need to find that willing participant, that early adopter who can uh, help influence the design of the cloud and adoption of that cloud and then become your evangelist internally to spread the word of how much better it was. And in my case, I was fortunate to have built the right thing because we collaborated on it and it was a richer performance experience. Uh, it was a... Uh, it wasn't painless to move people, but it was certainly kind of, in the end of the day, it was less expensive for them uh, on a cost per unit basis. We were doing chargebacks, so there was, that increased the ability to in, encourage more adoption later. Having the, having the internal uh, adopter who was evangelizing, we had our own evangelist as well, edu and educating, you need to educate as well. And then ultimately having that financial influencer to have a third of the cost per unit available on a private, private cloud chargeback versus, you know, uh, less performance and higher price per unit for a public cloud. Yeah. yeah generally, the way we start with a, with a, a large enterprise, and um, usually pretty carefully because we're a small company, um, is, is, with a, is with an inventory of their applications. So we'll, you know, the, the, the company I was talking about before, they got about 260 applications. Only about 40 of them were, were cloud suitable. And then we sort of further went and did an analysis on, you know, as to whether they're public cloud suitable or, or, or private cloud. Um, so I think that's a very important sort of step is sort of that, you know, that sort of inventory of your, uh, of the workloads and, and taking a really hard and honest look about 
how, you know, because a lot of, there, there are folks out there, there are application sort of product owners who, who are maybe a little bit, um, uh, you know, over uh, confident in the abilities of their application. Um, so, uh, you know, we typically with a large organization take a very conservative approach and sort of go for those, uh, those early adopters, those, those, you know, the, the lower hanging fruit, because you got to show those success stories. And then, uh, and then that sort of, bec those become the sort of uh, business cases and proof points and, and to drive the rest. And those tend to be uh, like mobile development, like mobile applications, the, like the new wave of applications in the regulated industries that tend to be those early adopters um, for, for public and private cloud. Mariano? Yeah, but uh, regarding the, the large enterprises I've been to, I have two examples for uh, Italian companies I've met. Uh, Pirelli, which is the tire company, and Ducati, which is the motorbike company. And uh, it's very strange how you look at uh, large companies from outside. You would think that Ducati is a very red-oriented and very passionate company, very uh, innovative. And you would think <laughs> that the tire company, typical tire company, is uh, tiring. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Instead, we found, um, I had this meeting with the uh, media marketing manager in, uh, in Ducati, and I had this conversation, it was very informal, and uh, he had this uh, poster behind him. I could not stop laughing because uh, the, the poster was, I love MILF, and uh, it, it, all the time <laughs> he had this, uh, this thing. And uh, it, <laughs> it was uh, unbelievable. And um, we understood that uh, they approached the cloud very early with Amazon, and they were already shrinking the domain of the private and, uh, um, I can say, the valuable information. They were shrinking the domain with, within SAP inside the company and they were setting up some gateways to take this information out and in just to protect the, the valuable data to design such an, an onion uh, around this uh, internally and externally. So they were almost ready and open-minded to go to the cloud. On the opposite, we went in Ducati and we s discovered that since du uh, the main uh, sponsor for Ducati is uh, Telecom Italia, which is the main uh, uh, telecom operator in Italy, they were uh, they they could not uh, buy from any others from them. But Telecom Italia, like any other telco company, is very far from understand and to 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 build and to sell the cloud, and so they have this uh, weird situation by which they had to order. VMs via fax, and <laughs> yes, they do. They send a fax and they get the VM in at least 30 days. That's that's the. So you, you you write your API call on the fax machine. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's it. That's it. So uh, we've been hearing a lot about um, uh, when you take these uh, like IT and, and application developers and you make these blended DevOps type teams, then uh, making sure that that. Uh, making sure that accountability is still held somewhere, people are still responsible, uh, and, and what, what, how would you manage blame when, when you've got these teams that um, are, are, go for it. Well, I, the first thought was, I know Ariel mentioned this earlier, like in, developers need pager duty. So once there's a mutual understanding of what that pain is, it, it changes behavior. The other one is, uh, and again, this is where I had initial resistance and as a part of my evolution, personal evolution into cloud too, is I used to track availability, right? And I cared about what I could control. So I had an availability number on network infrastructure and server infrastructure, et cetera. So as we matured in, in, in purely uh, mutual kind of collaboration around DevOps and application ops and infrastructure ops, there was a suggestion to essentially have one number for availability for the entire company that counted everything, including services we had no, nobody in the company had control over. So Zynga being very Facebook dependent, if the Facebook API went down, our games would generally go down. And there was a suggestion to our availability number should count everything. And what, what finally got me around is recognizing that the value of having that one number helps rally everybody around 
agreeing that that is what the number, that is the user experience for mm -hmm. what we are providing to the world. So it is the most representative, which yes, yeah, certainly having that data is critical because if you can't measure it, you can't fix it. And so knowing why each outage mattered or contributed was valuable to help focus that. Um, so did you put a dollar amount next to in every uh, outage? Oh yes, we are, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Um, but but the getting the culture kind of rallied yeah. around that. I mean, and, and also aligned very well to organizational um, uh, MBOs. So quarterly, we would have to set out as a purely infrastructure team. I had to have to commit to a total availability number for for all of the games. As uncomfortable as that was it drove all of the right behavior. Our collaboration with our peer group who did the application operations. My team in terms of, hey, network guys, yeah, I don't care if you have five nines of, of network availability, but you need to be transparent with what your hardware is doing so that when the app op guys have a suspected problem and they don't know what it is, that they know I can eliminate network or I need to focus on network, right? So getting that, the, the true transparency of all the different pieces of this infrastructure. So that, that just doing that one very simple thing of everybody agreeing on the availability number drove a lot of alignment and collaboration. So I think that was a terrible question. <laughs> um, Damn it. And I'll tell you why, because I think the question is, is the way you phrase the question is, is, well, one, flawed, and two, also indicative of exactly how people within organizations ask that same question. Um, and, and the reason is that you're looking for where to place blame, and I think that's the wrong pursuit when you're trying to improve your availability. Mm -hmm. I think what you need to start with, an assumption of um, you know, trust, that you know, everybody in the company is doing the right thing for the business. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you, when you have um, problems that come up, if your perspective is you know, who is the person or team that needs to get blamed, then the way people are going to approach that investigation is how do I defer responsibility from me to the next guy, mm -hmm. right? And that doesn't help you identify what the actual root causes and the actual reasons are for why you're having problems. So Versus at the Chef Conference this year, we heard a lot of talk about blameless um, management. Yeah, so is I that mean, what that's, you're referring that's to? exactly, uh, you know, that's a great way of putting it. Um, you know, at Netflix, for example, each one of our, you know, postmortems was really focused around um, identifying what the reason, and usually not reason, but reasons for uh, things uh, not to go the way that we wanted them to go, and then deciding whether, you know, what the reason for that was, and, and typically it was because it was just resource investment. You know, we decided to invest into moving very quickly, into investing into innovation, and not enough into the tooling that we needed in order to get code safely into production, or into, um, you know, the right communication between teams, or, you know, basically what is it that you can do so that something like this won't happen again next time, and if your answer to that is, well, we have to be more careful, then that's wrong, right? Because everybody's already being as careful as, as they can be. Mm -hmm. And so you're assuming that that's the steady state. So I think the way you approach outages, the way you approach your postmortems, um, is gonna be very telling of the kinds of results that you get. And if you approach it from the perspective of, you know, which team is responsible for what, and you know, who carries the blame when something goes wrong, then you're gonna create a culture of, trying to avoid blame because, you know, who wants to be blamed for things? But if you look at it from the perspective of, you know, we're all trying to improve our availability and, you know, the reason we're not where we want to be is because we might not be investing in the right levels in the right things, mm -hmm. then it becomes much more of a collaborative uh, exercise in order to how to raise the bar. Uh, on the on the standpoint of the vendor, uh, we are the last uh, step. Always blame uh, the, the vendor. Always <laughs> blame the vendor. But uh, our approach is uh, since we have nobody to put the blame onto, we are uh, we have this uh, approach. We we take the blame on us, but we explain what happened. So. Uh, and at the first time, uh, the customer is happy because it has some, someone to put the blame on too. But answers are starting to coming up from below and they go all the way back to the exact responsible person. Okay, So in the t in dur during this uh, time, you see that people uh, start to consider you reliable more than blameable and they still put the blame on you, but they get answers, so they trust you. You build the trust by taking the blame and giving answers. Then, in time, you get less blame and more trust. 
You and Jen, <clears throat> do you have any experience in what I Lots of experience yeah. with, uh, with, with blame. <laughs> um, so, I mean, a lot of the larger organizations we work with are um, very siloed, um, and uh, they, are, they, they, they play this blame game uh, constantly. Um, what we've been, where we've seen success with some of the large organizations is taking, uh, is, is sort of uh, encouraging them to create sort of small teams that cross these silos that are focused on very particular, like identifiable service delivery and business results and having them as a team responsible for making sure that that, that result is, uh, is achieved. Um, it's, it's hard to do because you know, depending on the culture of the organization, uh, but that's where uh, we're seeing results. And there's actually a bit of a movement in the enterprise world towards, um, I don't know if anybody's heard of uh, intrapreneurship, um, but there's sort of a, uh, the whole sort of, uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of folks running around sort of trying to bring kind of lean methodology and more sort of DevOps style uh, approach to problems in large enterprise. and. We're starting to see some uh, uh, some success stories there, and I think GE actually hired like they 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 had their whole organization go through training around that. So, um, but I think it's still early days, at least for the large organizations. But where I think the small companies have an advantage in terms of adapting, and obviously the ones who are already very sort of you know already focused on sort of uh, more uh, next generation uh, business models. Uh, I'm going to pause you for yeah. just a second. Uh, we're going to take questions shortly, so if you can line up behind the microphone, uh, we'll take them there. Go. Sorry. Um, but but with but with the large companies, I mean, they're you know they're like aircraft carriers that take a while to uh, <laughs> a while to change direction. Uh, so where we're seeing results is if if people can sort of carve out a very particular problem, bring together sort of a community of practice around it that hopefully spans a couple of those silos and then be uh, sort of held responsible for achieving a particular business result instead of you know, being responsible for just you know, making sure that, uh, I don't know, uh, One you, know, part a, stays a, a, you know, storage doesn't crash. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so we have, a, we have a couple minutes left, so if you have any questions, feel free to go up to the microphone, otherwise uh, I'll just continue on. Um, so for cloud adoption, uh, we've heard uh, some cases where there's, there was endorsements at the very highest levels for cloud adoption, uh, and there's in other cases where it's very much of a grassroots effort. What do you think is best for an organization to, to adopt cloud? Whether it, is it best for, for it to come from, from below or from the top? Mark always takes the first question. <laughs> <laughs> as long as my voice works. Um, so, I've seen the Skunk Works grassroots, mm -hmm. um, it, it, where it can run into a major obstacle is if there isn't strong alignment, at least with the technical leadership of a company, so the CTO or VPs of engineering, to ensure that you have a customer who is going to be mandated because you can't control engineering from the operations side. You, you need to ensure that you have alignment and a mandate to in, to ensure that you have customers at the end of the day. So I, I don't think it's exclusively either. Um, uh, more often than not, I do see kind of the executive leadership trying to influence this because they're the ones paying attention to the marketplace, uh, but they may not have enough bandwidth within the technical organization to actually start educating themselves about what it is to, to start down this cloud path. And that, I think that's where in executives ensuring that they have people who are resourced to be able to investigate these things and not just running around doing heroics uh, to keep the existing production up is, is key. There's an easy road and a hard road. Um, and, and I think the easy road is when you have the top level you know, executive mm -hmm. realize that they, the key to them having you know, greater business agility is um, to transform the organization into one that takes advantage of elastic uh, compute resources and elastic platforms. And um, you know, I, I've seen this firsthand in Netflix since that's very much kind of how it came down. Reed was you know, himself a really big proponent of moving to the cloud. And that just saved us so much time of having to get buy-in, you know, having to kind of have all of those kind of political discussions around, you know, which, where resources are going to come from and what's the right approach. It's, you know, we know that this is a key in order for us to be more agile, in order for us to be more innovative. And, you know, the, the question is how 
um, and not if. Now, you know, you can also do it with the Skunk Works way. Um, I think it's harder because you're going to end up coming up, having to overcome a lot of imp uh, impediments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having that high level sponsor, you know, the CTO or a VP of engineering or someone who can at least give you air cover. Uh, helps with that, but you know it's certainly a harder road to go down when you're trying to do this, you know, in a small individual level, than as a broad organization with all the resources and, and kind of all of the alignment already behind you. Yeah, and of course it helps if you have grassroots that validates the CIO's vision, or CTO's vision. All right, thanks everyone for uh, for uh, sitting in on this session. Uh, we'll be around for the next uh, couple of minutes, so if you have any questions to take to us privately, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, thank you very much, and please let's thank the panelists.